Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, in the course of Fundamental Principles in Bioethics within the program of uh, the Master's in Bioethics at St. Thomas University, beginning always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed Trinity, we love you, we adore you, and in the midst of the challenges and difficulties of our lives uh, now, we thank you for your blessings, for the gift of life, for having us here today, and for all the hidden blessings that you give us on a daily basis. We pray that you inspire us during these uh, lectures, during this program, as we explore the intersection between your creative activity, Lord, and the process of evolution here on Earth and throughout the universe as we see the splendor of the universe unfolding um, before us and in front of us, allowing us for the possibility of uh, uh, being in awe at your presence. We continue to pray for those who are in most need of your divine mercy at this time. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so before going any further, since I'm giving you back uh, feedback on your summaries, then I have this little table here that shows some of the um, uh, scratches that I make on your, on your summaries some of the abbreviations that I use, okay? And Chris and Jordan, I'll be emailing you your uh, summaries, not emailing. Well, actually I can scan it, I think of that. I'll scan them um, this afternoon sometimes so that you can have them, okay? And then put it on the mail. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you see three little dots or actually the little dots become three scratches and they look like three little lines. That just means therefore, that stuck with me. Anybody know that symbol where it comes from? Three little dots. You wouldn't believe this. Uh, this is from high school geometry. When I was taking geometry in high school in Guatemala with the Jesuits, <laughs> okay, uh, they use the, um, it's a standard uh, nomenclature for meaning therefore, which when we have in geometry, they're all the, the proofs of the theorems, right? Step by step. It's like algebra going, solving an equation, you go step by step. And the last step was the conclusion. Therefore, uh, you know, A equal to Z. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C and C is equal to D, <laughs> then all the way down, A equal to Z, the, the very last conclusion. And so these little three dots are used in geometry. They used to be used in geometry anyway, to mean therefore, okay? And so I use that uh, a lot in my uh, little scribbles there. Also, in other words, you're probably familiar with these, but anyway, just to be on the same page for everybody. I-O-W, I didn't know what this was uh, when I was looking at it at some point, and then someone told me, no, that means in other words. <laughs> so, okay, now I use it because Versus or against, this is from Latin. It just means one thing against another when we're making comparisons. The wiggle, again, is also from uh, arithmetic. It means more or less, about or approximately, more or less, all right, approximately, the little wiggle, and instead of. So those are just some of the abbreviations that I use in my comments on your summaries. And so it's the first slide on this uh, lecture so that you have it as a reference <laughs> after a while you become familiar with it. If at any point you don't understand my chicken scratch because the problem is I'm left-handed and with the computer now it turns out that for decades now since uh, ever since I entered the seminary so you can add 35 years of priesthood plus five of seminary 40 years ago um, I did my high school in Latin America and so it was more the European style where it's more academic. Bottom line, I never ne learned how to type, touch type in high school. Now, I understand that here in the United States, typically they teach that in high school, right? Just like they teach uh, traffic, uh, what driving. Uh, I didn't learn from high school. I learned in the streets of Mexico City how to drive. <laughs> and, uh, but I never learned touch typing. And then 
uh, when I got into the seminary, I thought to myself, for the rest of my life, I'll be spending uh, time, a lot of time, significant time, writing stuff like term papers and everything else. So I taught myself touch typing in, in, during the seminary <laughs> time, okay? It was just a little booklet. And anyway, the point of all that is that now I can actually type faster than I can write longhand. And so I seldom write anything because I'm left-handed and with left-handed we go on top of what we write. You people are very young and don't have a clue, but uh, there used to be something called a fountain pen, which had ink inside. And so I always had this part of my pinky black because I would smear with left-handers, we, we smear on top, we go over on top of what we write. Instead of right-handedness that goes away from the writing, you know, we go on top of it. And back in the days of the ink, I, I, mean, I still remember the, the wooden desk that had a flip-flop top and a hole here on the side for the ink container, the black ink container. And we would load our fountain, the brand new fountain pens that you could load ink into. And then right away, you know, and the sister, the nun would come around with a ruler and crack my knuckles because I had horrible handwriting from the beginning, calligraphy. Anyway, all that is, uh, bottom line is uh, that uh, my handwriting is not too legible. Uh, so I try to print or something that is somehow legible. If ever you have any questions or comments about my comment, uh, let me know, okay? All right, <clears throat> enough technicalities. Let's... Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Like yes, thank you very much. Yes, it's recording. I remember. There it is. It's a little, it's a little red dot here. That's possible. They could make it any smaller. They would not, of course, have made it microscopic. Uh, oh, what I will do is this. Let's see if it's not too... Give it a minute for your eyes to adjust. And uh, that's better. You can still take some notes there in the back. Okay. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> so the, the issue is this, we're looking at origins, right? We're looking at origins uh, ontogenetically and phylogenetically. Mm, can anyone tell me what I mean by ontogenetic origin of the human? Ontos mean being, the self, all right? So when we, and gen, uh, genesis, ontogenetically, we have a lot of these compound words, right, in science uh, that come from the Latin. Genesis is origins or beginning. So ontogenesis is the beginning of the individual, each one of us, the individual human being. So really, the, the ontogenesis of the human is, answers the question, when does human life begin, right? It's another way of putting it, when does human life begin? I don't know if you saw the announcement of the uh, candidate, the most likely candidate for the Supreme Court to uh, replace Justice uh, Ginsburg is uh, Justice um, Amy Connie uh, Barrett. Barrett? She's in her 40s. She's gonna be, with the grace of God, a Supreme Court justice, which she could be on the bench for 40 years. <laughs> How many presidents is she gonna see in 40 years? How many administrations, okay? So this is very significant. She already declared openly, she's a practicing Catholic, and she believes uh, uh, in the dignity and the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. We know all the consequences that I have had, that's like a political bombshell that just, it's about to explode in DC, one more, all right? And so all this uh, two months before general elections of, uh, in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. But this issue, you know, when does life begin? I remember that question was asked to President Obama on his first day when he was running for office uh, for the presidency back eight plus three, 13, 11 years ago. He was asked that question by one of the reporters uh, and he just said, that's above my pay grade. That was his answer, that's above my pay grade. And yet in high school, we teach biology and we teach fertilization, we teach uh, embryology, right? At least I was taught that in high school. 
And that kid wouldn't pass the grade, wouldn't pass the course if he didn't know, or she didn't know the proper answer to when does life begin. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you see that that answer it has tremendous implications, bioethical and social and political and economic and technological implications uh, in the United States and throughout the world. And so we're gonna leave that for next semester, which will be after the elections. <laughs> uh, now we're looking at the other origin, not of the individual human, but what? Of the species as a whole. Okay, so this is the phylogenetics, right? Why phylogenetics? Phylum is a reference to what? To the species as a whole, to the group, right? So phylum is to the group as a whole. When did the human species arise? That is also a loaded question, right? Because when, if we talk about when did we begin, for certain people in society, let's say basically believers and believers in the Bible, they don't have to be Christian, they can be Jewish, for example, or Muslim, which are all monotheist, okay? Uh, believing in one God. For many of those people, uh, especially if they consider themselves devout and practicing in their own particular faith, when would they say that we began as a species, the humans began with uh, two people, right? And they're called Adam and Eve, and God created them out of mud from his will. Yeah. And he breathed into Adam the breath of life. And then Eve, of course, we know Eve came out of a rib from Adam, okay, so that she can serve the man. So the woman is supposed to serve the man. That's the, <laughs> that's the purpose of creating the woman. <laughs> that's the biblical narrative, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, pre-Christian right, pre-Christian, because the Old Testament was obviously before the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So if we take that text literally, it actually becomes quite offensive uh, uh, from certain aspect for women, for example. They're not just, uh, you know, they're not slaves of, of the men, for one thing. And for the other, the creation like that from mud, that's a challenge, right? So what I'm trying to do here in this course is present you with the alternative that makes much more sense. And it's at the same time, faithful, if you will, or true to both the science and the faith, okay? Which is a non-literal interpretation of Genesis one and two or three or any part of the Bible, but rather a deeper, what we call the census plenier, which is the deeper sense of the passage. We'll get there. So. In other words, uh, we're looking at the theory and the process of evolution as a possible explanation of how our species arose. And of course, this would apply to all species because these are universal principles. Okay? And that's really the, uh, the validity of it is that it applies across the board, not just for the human, obviously, but for any species that we see today, the two million species approximately that we have been able to uh, classify so far or, or discover. And um, there's something else there. We'll come to it. Okay, so just a very brief review. I did a very, very quick review of uh, science and the rise of science. Um, what we call modern science, okay, modern science for the the past 500 years, more or less, with the Copernican revolution in Europe, the challenge of, so on the one hand, the religious and uh, theological beliefs of the time, which was mostly Catholicism and Christendom. And on the other hand, the overwhelming evidence, the increasing evidence, just from observation of the astronomical uh, phenomena, the facts, that for an increasing number of uh, observants, or let's call them uh, scientists of the time, uh, they're realizing that the earth, well, already since the time of the Greeks, really we knew or people knew that uh, the earth was uh, round, well, was not flat, okay? And they had uh, evidence of that, indirect evidence, uh, 
from a number of measurements that have been done and deductions. Uh, but in the Renaissance, 1400s, uh, 1500s in Europe, there was a rediscovery of classical Greece and classical Rome, talking about several centuries before the time of Christ, but particularly Greek thought, all right? And there were observations, uh, Galileo, for example, would stand at the shoreline and would notice one big thing at the time of Renaissance that moved science forward was the economy. It's always been that way. The economy, the business moves technology and technology moves science forward. So for example, Galileo, when he was designing his um, uh, telescope, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take off my jacket because it's getting humid in here. So you see that I have a jacket, so now I can take it off. Uh, <clears throat> the ports of call around the Mediterranean were very important for trade, all right? And there was trade all around the Mediterranean uh, from Europe into the Middle East, into Northern Africa, around and around, and it was like a two-way highway of boats, of ships that were going back and forth, all the different ports. One very big port of trade was Venice because it sat right at the tip of the Adriatic there and it traded between the Orient, the East and the West. So a lot of stuff went through the markets of Venice and the big merchant families were the wealthy families in Venice and in many of these ports of uh, throughout Europe, all right? So for example, details, the different merchant families, they would trade and they would negotiate and they would barter on the market, on the marketplace for the, um, the stuff that was coming in to be traded. And for example, <clears throat> if someone had um, an idea of what was going to be coming into the port, for example, silk from China or spices from Africa or something like that, or from the Orient, right? They could jack up the price just before the ship got to port and then they could buy and sell at a higher price and so forth. So they could, it's come a little bit of this inside trading that uh, the, they do in the stock market, which is highly legal, right? But back then the laws were very different. So basically if um, if merchants had an idea of what merchandise was coming into port beforehand, they could then um, manipulate the prices before the merchandise actually got to port, all right? So uh, Galileo's telescope was commissioned by one of these merchant families, and before his telescope pointed uh, vertically, his telescope was pointed horizontally to the horizon to detect the flag of the ships that were coming into port because from the flag, the merchants could tell what ship was coming and where the ship was coming from and what kind of merchandise they would bring more or less, okay? They would have an idea from the flag. There was those long flags that you've seen tapering like triangular, right? And they had all kinds of emblems on them. And then he observed something he observed that the ships that were coming from far away that he could see with his telescope, the naked eye could only see a little dot, but he, with his telescope, which is just lenses from, again, from what the Greeks were doing two millennia prior, uh, they could, uh, he could tell not only the flag of the ship, but he noticed that the ship was appearing, right? That uh, if the earth were flat, the ship would be totally there at the horizon, like a little tiny dot where you could see the, the whole silhouette of the ship. And the ship, if the earth were flat, think about this in your mind's eye, if the earth were flat, the ship would be totally complete, but in miniature at the horizon, at the point, uh, el punto de fuga, at the vanishing point, and then coming forward, the ship would just get larger and larger and larger proportionally, right? But in fact, he noticed that that was not the case. Invariably, what he would see first from the ship was just the tip of the mast. He would see the tip of the mast and as the ship got closer, he would see more of the ship sticking out. He would see more of the ship and eventually from the mast, he would see the deck of the ship and eventually the full ship, right? And that's the effect. So just reasoning, that would be the effect if the ship was coming from a curve, 
instead of a flat surface. If the ship was coming from a curve up, that's what, that's the observation of the eye, is the mast first, the tip of the mast, and then uh, the rest of the ship gradually appearing. And so that observation, it's a, you see, it's an analytical observation, and it's a critical observation, it's a scientific observation. And he makes his deductions out of that. That was a confirmation that the Earth, in see, indeed, there was a slope. Out of the horizon, there was a slope, all right? And then all they needed to do to, to prove that is that whenever they moved into sea and they kept going and going, that slope kept going further. You know, the slope kept going down in front of them consistently, and they could observe that all the way around 360 degrees. Okay, so in the middle of the ocean, for example, they would see ships arising from all sides 360 degrees around from this slope. All right, so. That's what evidence. And then out of curiosity, he pointed his telescope because it was commissioned by one of these merchant families uh, and that's how they made their money. And uh, then out of curiosity, he pointed his telescope vertically and started looking at stars and planets and realized that, oh, that large luminous body up there is actually a planet. It's not luminous at all. It's reflecting the sun's light, <laughs> all right, and so forth. And then the little tiny dot is not actually a dot, it's a whole bunch of dots, they're constellations and so forth. So these were observations that were being done and calculations, they were also very big into physics and mathematics. So they were calculating the, um, the orbit of the earth, the rotation, and then the orbit around the sun and so forth. So invariably this heliocentric uh, view was, uh, proposed, okay, which is that the Earth rotates around the sun, which went directly diametrically opposed to the church's belief and teaching that uh, the Earth is geocentric, that the universe is geocentric, meaning uh, that the Earth is a center. And I explained that that was the view of, from strictly a theological point of view of the incarnation, if God became incarnate on earth, then this has to be uh, the center of the universe. This has to be uh, the theological center of the universe, okay? Uh, as it turns out, the heliocentric is not even correct either. It's heliocentric for only for our planetary system. But our planetary system is embedded within a constellation that we call the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is one of millions of galaxies that are out there. So where's the center? Is there a center? <laughs> Right, we can ask the question, is there a center for the universe? It's, um, there was a center. If we turn the clock backwards in our mind's eye again, going backwards, you know, hypothetically, uh, because of the expansion that is being recorded, uh, we assume that there was, we could contract the universe to that moment of singularity about how long ago, more or less, How long ago, the moment of singularity, the Big Bang? 13.7 billion years ago, right? So 10 to the nine, which is a very big number. Mm -hmm. All right, so at least those three numbers should be conversant already, right? We need certain data to be able to speak with competence. 13.7, close to 14 billion years ago, the origin of the universe, uh, the origin of the planetary system, we'll see in the environmental course, actually, we'll get a little bit into uh, the planetary system, is about uh, four and a half billion years ago. And then the origin of life, shortly after that, as soon as the crust is cool enough to hold liquid water, about 3.9 billion, four billion years ago, we'll see the origin of life also from organic material, from inorganic to organic. And then the origin of human, right, the phylogenetics, anywhere between 2 million to 200,000 years ago. Okay, all right. So the other bottom line I wanna say about that is that creationism, in other words, a literal interpretation of scripture is not the Catholic interpretation. We take exception to that with all due respect to fundamentalists. Uh, 
because it gets us into trouble. And toward the second half of this course, I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, the, the implications of using a fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible, and then what is an alternative, which is a logical, reasonable alternative. Okay? Uh, and then in Meyer, of course, he gets into it in his first chapter. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but uh, do uh, read that first chapter already. All right. It was actually we were supposed to integrate it a little bit into the, uh, the lecture. I know that I only touched on it uh, toward the end. But basically, he addresses origins according to the constructs of his own time. Keep in mind that now he, uh, he lived, uh, he started hundred years ago, in, I think it was 1904 to 2005, right? He lived hundred years, 101 years, uh, but he was young in, his, in the 1920s and 1930s. And the general consensus was still a pretty much a literal interpretation of uh, the Bible in many quarters, even though already Protestants were doing uh, Protestant scholars, biblical scholars, were doing critical analysis at the end of the 1800s already in certain quarters in Germany, in Great Britain, in uh, France, uh, some in Italy also, of the Bible, literal criticism, putting the Bible into its historical context. But that was occurring in academia, in certain circles, really, it was not getting out into the general public and it was not getting out into the hierarchy of the Catholic Church either, all right? So the general belief or the tool of interpretation was basically literal, read the Bible or don't read the Bible, but leave it alone. Don't be uh, trying to interpret that text uh, other than what it's saying. All right, so that was unfortunate. It was also unfortunate that Darwin and Mendel never really met or corresponded. They could have corresponded. It's the second half of the 1800s. They're already publishing for several centuries now. Journals, uh, and papers, articles are being published. Uh, and I mentioned the anecdote of uh, Dalton giving Darwin uh, Mendel's paper and Darwin putting it aside because the, the anecdote goes, he didn't understand the math, right? Very, Sad, very simple, because there were percentages, there were proportions. Uh, the classical three to one ratio of recessive to dominance that we'll look into. So we need to get into genetics. I'm gonna do that in the next uh, semester when we look at the ontogenetic origin of life, all right? And now the phylogenetic, we're looking at the other two, which is the tool of explanation, the mechanism, which is evolution. So bottom line, uh, we're going to be looking in this lecture at some of the evidence for evolution, okay? And then in the following lectures, we're going to be looking at the mechanisms, the, the, the fundamental forces of evolution, uh, and then we'll dovetail that into a biblical analysis, especially of Genesis 1 and 2. So this is some of the evidence for uh, evolution from the fossil record morphological similarities, comparative embryology, vestigial structures, biogeography, and molecular evidence. And there's a little bit of a chronology here from the most well-known or, or the earlier known, the earlier known to the more recent stuff, okay? So the fossil record was pretty much the first to appear centuries ago. Remember one of the big sciences back in the time of uh, Darwin and Mendel, the 17 and 1800, was mapping the contour of the continents precisely for trade, to find ports of call, to find places that had natural harbors, for example, that could harbor ships uh, when there was uh, high seas, when there were storms, etc. So geography was a big science first, and then that uh, as these expeditions continued, natural, natural science uh, scientists went into these expeditions like Darwin did with the Beagle. I don't know if I ever mentioned the, uh, His Royal Majesty's Beagle was the name of the ship because the, the Royal Majesty, in other words, the king or queen of the time had a Beagle dog, <laughs> and the ship was named after that. 
So that was the, the Beagle was a famous uh, ship on which uh, Darwin went around the world for about five years, collected specimens from all over the place. In fact, he used some of those specimens that he brought back to uh, Great Britain. He sold them to make some money for his, uh, for his living, all right, and maintaining his family. Uh, and then some got eaten up by the ants also. I mean, he had uh, a lot of hardship. Um, anyway, let's go forward then with uh, the fossil record to begin with. This is stuff that is there. Okay, and the fossil record is not just preserved hard tissue, let's say, hard structures of uh, animals, but also imprints, okay? It's also an imprint is also considered a fossil. So for example, we have, like you can see here with the plain eye, these uh, structures that look very much like organisms. This is not just rocks or stones, that happen to gather in this shape, right? It's, it, it would be insane to consider that these are just stones that happen to have this particular shape. No, this is actually uh, animals that died and their bones mostly or their chiton skeleton was mineralized and was, um, it became rock because the tissue actually mineralized, mostly the hard tissue, okay? So mostly bone structure or uh, cartilage doesn't really preserve well, but sometimes um, beyond having um, uh, bone, which many animals don't have bones, uh, it could be their skeleton. For example, this is a crinoid, this is a sea lily, which belongs to the echinoderms, to the family of the sea urchin and the, and the starfish. And they actually have an endoskeleton in the sense that they have these plates that are calcified plates, mostly from calcium carbonate, similar to coral. And then they have a thin layer of skin on top of it. So a kind of derm, starfish, uh, sea urchins, and these uh, sea lilies and sea whips and so forth. No, not sea whips, those are, uh, um, sea whips are uh, polyps there. They belong to the, um, uh, to the corals, soft corals. But anyway, they have a calcified skeleton which when they die can get mineralized, right? And become uh, like a rock. Hmm? But how come it black? Yes, it's just the color, uh, it's a particular color. I, I'm thinking that it probably has a lot of carbon that uh, mineralized in there, okay? Uh, so the color, yes, it, it can vary, but it's a big contrast. It helps because it makes a contrast with mostly sandstone, which is thin and has less carbon in it. So that means then that whatever we see in addition to the skeleton, just outside here, these black dots and smears could also be fossils, all right? But I wanna point out that uh, uh, two things, uh, three things actually, it doesn't have to be bone skeleton, which mineralizes very fairly easily. It can also be a chitin, which is a protein, all right, which is in um, um, articulate ar arthropods. This is a trilobite, which is related to the, I don't know if you've seen, um, what do you call these things? Uh, horseshoe crabs, horseshoe crabs, which are not real crabs. I, I, have you ever seen a horseshoe crab? Yeah. Uh, I used to, when I was living in South Miami, I used to go to a park called Matheson Hammock. And uh, periodically, depending on what uh, the season was doing, the horseshoe crabs would come to shore. And some of them were so large that I could actually stand on one and the thing would move. They were so strong, okay? But I just wanted to point out horseshoe uh, crab. Yeah, they're related and these are living today you can see they're very similar to the trilobite, which is extinct and uh, fossilized. But uh, because they have eight pairs of legs at the bottom, one, two, three, four, and these are echelicery, these are actually um, adapted um, pincers, all right? They're not um, crabs at all. They are actually uh, arachnoids. They are uh, spiders. They're sea spiders, <laughs> which have a super hard uh, 
cephalothorax, head and, and, and thorax fused together, and then they have the abdomen, and they have lungs, they have book lungs, which are here in the back, all right? These open and fan out like that. And so they are actually spiders <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, crabs at all. But anyway, they're cohosho crabs. And uh, I've actually seen this phenomenon out in the ocean years ago. All right, so mm, this is a trilobite. You can see it's uh, fairly similar. And they don't have a skeleton because they, they don't, well, they have an exoskeleton, yeah, but they don't have a bone internal skeleton. They don't have an endoskeleton like we do calcified. Rather, it's made out of chitin, which is a protein, but that can also get mineralized, as you can see here. Another type of fossil is when the insect becomes embedded, the whole insect becomes embedded in amber. And then you can speculate about uh, Jurassic Park uh, going after the mosquitoes that are embedded in amber and see if they have any, uh, if they sucked on the blood of a dinosaur, then they could get an RBC, which would be nucleated because a uh, reptile and bird uh, RBCs are nucleated. They have a nucleus. Ma mammal RBCs are enucleated. We dish out a mature RBCs. We dish out our nucleus. Okay, but for birds and reptiles and amphibians and, and fish, their uh, RBCs uh, have a nucleus, which means the genome in there, right? And that was the whole. I know. Did you see Jurassic Park movie? No. See it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> they go after these. Whenever they find an, a piece of amber, which is um, uh, crystallized uh, resin from pine trees, from conifers that were very abundant at the time, right? We're going back 60, 70 million years ago. They find a fossilized insect in there. If the insect was a mosquito or mosquito-like uh, creature that would be a blood sucker, the idea was that in their abdomen, they would have the blood of whatever animal they sucked on, right? Which typically would be a dinosaur from the time. And since if they were reptiles, uh, which is still debatable, uh, then um, um, they would have some uh, nucleus from the RBCs where they could, from a single nucleus, they could generate the whole dinosaur back up, <laughs> right? With uh, cloning. Anyway, science fiction, but plausible, scientifically plausible. Mm. So the fossil record, what do we do with this? When we look at it, we can't just say, well, uh, maybe God just created these species in isolation and then left them there and they died and then he created other species in isolation and there's no connection between the species. All right, that's possible. We'll address that as we go forward. Mm. I want to point out, oh yes, and an imprint is also a fossil, okay? So it's not just animals that fossilize, some plants also fossilize. Plants also fossilize, all right? So for example, here's a trunk of a palm tree, <laughs> right, that is fossilized. Here is a fern-like structure that is fossilized. And so forth, this is evidently a leaf, a palmate leaf that is fossilized. Um, and so this most likely is an imprint, the tissue itself, has given way because it was cellulose, which is not that uh, resistant uh, to time. It's going to break up eventually, but it left an imprint. So fossils can be not just fossilized bone, which is the most typical one and the one that lasts the longest, we could say, but it could also be uh, embedded animals in amber. It could be uh, fossilized chitin uh, from invertebrates, or it could be also imprints on the sand or the silt or the sediment, all right? So this is what we call the fossil record, which we have really more and more fossils are discovered as we go along. I used to have a collection of fossils uh, when I was teaching biology at St. Brendan High School. And then when I went into the seminary, I donated it to the high school. But uh, my brother and sister-in-law used to live in Colorado, and we'd go camping sometimes for days, and we'd find fossils along the way because Colorado has a lot of uplifting from uh, uh, from uh, the mountain range, the, the the crunching that is happening and rising the, the 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 Rocky Mountain range is at the edge of a continental plate. We'll look at uh, continental drift 
and seafloor spreading a little later on, and how the edges buckle up and they form mountain ranges, okay? So all these uh, profiles can be seen along the way, and what we get is this uh, stratigraphy, all right, that uh, is, uh, has fossils in it. So when it's undisturbed and we go through this stratigraphy, these layers deeper and deeper, we find that there are generally more recent and more complex organisms on the upper layers and we find more primitive organisms in the bottom layers. So there is a chronology that can be seen vertically as we go from layer of sediment to layer of deeper, deeper in, we see that the deeper layers have more primitive organisms, number one. Number two, that there are some similarities between the different organisms that are found, whether it's on plants and animals, just their morphology is similar, but it's not quite the same species, all right? So just like we, we classify current living organisms, we also classify uh, fossils, and yes, we classify them with the universal nomenclature, which is the Linnaean binomial nomenclature. At this point, you should know what that means, which is genus and species, right? For these fossils. So we can classify the fact that they're dead and buried uh, is no um, objection to classifying them because obviously they were living at some time. So they were, they used to be living organisms and therefore they should be classified. And that um, um, amplifies our database of organisms that have been on earth. Okay. So uh, it's very important to observe this stratigraphy and what layer, what sedimental layer the fossils were found because we can also date these layers. We can date them by isotope, um, the half-life of the isotopes of the elements. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. The biggest one that you've heard of, I'm sure, is carbon-14 dating which has a range of about 6,000 years. It's a nice, good chunk of time that uh, can be multiplied, all right? And so to determine the layers, it brings it to the thousands of years. We can go into hundreds of thousands or into millions of years by measuring the decay, the half-life of other isotopes, bigger isotopes, even like uranium and so forth. We'll get there. But basically what I'm pointing out with this the slide is the strata, the stratigraphy of the fossil record that is chronological. So that the more uh, primitive uh, fossils are in the deeper layers, meaning that they live longer ago and became extinct longer ago, uh, more ancient, okay? All right, more evidence for uh, the possibility of evolution. Here is explaining this stratific stratigraphy from the geological perspective. In other words, that we look at a mountain, a mountain range, of course, we have to go at least into Northern Florida or out of Florida together to see any significant mountains here. But we know, you know that on the East Coast, we have the Appalachians. On the West Coast, we have the Rocky Mountains, two large mountain ranges of the US. You notice that they're more or less on the edges, on the two edges of the continent, hmm? on the two edges of the North America. And we look at mountains and we can stay there the whole day looking at the mountain and say, well, this mountain hasn't moved an inch all day long. And I come back the next day, it still hasn't moved and year after year, but the mountains are moving slowly but surely, okay? There is movement, those geologic movement very, very slowly but it is in a dynamic state, especially when we bump it up to geologic time, geologic time meaning typically in the hundreds of thousands or billions of years. Because if the earth is four and a half billion year, you know, how many millions do we need to get to one billion? How many millions do we need to get to one billion? A thousand million, all right? And how many thousands of years do we need to get to a million? 
a thousand thousands. <laughs> so geologic time is very slow, very slow, but significant. And in that slowness, these mountains are actually moving. <laughs> They're going from a plain to a whole huge mountain range that could be one mile high. Like for example, Denver, which is at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. There's a stadium there. I don't like football, I hate football, but uh, people like football. They're playing football today here in college, mm -hmm. at the university. And there is a stadium in, in Denver, very famous, and it's called Mile High Stadium. Why is it called Mile High Stadium? Because Denver and the whole plateau of the Midwest is one mile above sea level, 5,000 feet above sea level. It's the whole Midwest of the United States. Where'd that come from? That came from sediment. That came from sediment that has been deposited there by the Mississippi River and all the other tributaries. Actually, that used to be a sea, all right? It was called the Mississippi Sea during the tropicalization of the earth. When all the poles were melted, the level of water was here one to two miles high, <laughs> okay? And so the whole middle of the U.S. was an ocean, a sea, and it was called the Mississippi Sea. <laughs> All right, now it's the Great Plains, <laughs> the Midwest, the breadbasket of the U.S. All right, so these mountain ranges are in a dynamic state and there is uplifting and uh, other phenomena that are occurring. So you can see this stratigraphy here. I've seen these things actually on the side of the road just like that, going through Colorado, all right, through the Rocky Mountains. And times, if you get lucky, you can see some fossils embedded in there. This looks like a heavy coal region here because of the black, right? Um, uh, this other one, you look at, look at this stratigraphy. This has gone vertical. So in other words, this has had two motions. One motion was the deposit of sediment that got wrinkled, as you can see here, right? So it might turn this thing around horizontally or look at it sideways like this. This is to be sideways and it was sedimented, as you can see, and buckled up, right? And then the whole mountain range moved up <laughs> vertically. So there's a lot of movement that has gone here, but the stratigraphy is there and it's exposed and can be measured by a radioactive isotope decay, what we call the half-life, to give a date in typically in thousands of years to each one of these layers. So the fossils that are found in there most likely were living at that time, all right? This is also, by the way, this is called a boulder field here, these rocks, which uh, are thought to have been uh, grounded up like this very smoothly. I've seen them, again, going camping in the Colorado uh, mountain range. Uh, some are huge, as large as this room. Others are as small as our fist. But the common characteristic between all of the rocks in a boulder field is that they're all rounded off and very smooth, all right? This was done most likely by, um, what do you call those? The ice, the big ice moving back and forth, glaciers. Glaciers moving back and forth in between the uh, winterization and tropicalization of the earth, all right? Uh, advancing and receding, grinding the surface of the earth. And in some points, it created lakes, like the Great Lakes uh, between US and Canada, and other places it created these boulder fields. This is the grinding of the, of the ice, which you can imagine one mile of ice is pretty darn heavy, right? <laughs> and it can do basically whatever it wants on the ground, moving back and forth. So a very interesting geologic phenomena. These typically are full of uh, marmot colonies, marmots. Marmots, it's a mammal that, uh, they're brown and they stick out their heads and then they scream and they hide inside the boulders. It's impossible to find them inside the boulders. But uh, one time they ate the tubes underneath the van that we were, my brother and sister-in-law and I, we went up camping and at the head of the trails, you can park your cars there and then uh, go into the trail and you can walk for days, weeks, whatever you want, whatever supplies you bring with you. And so we did that and when we came back, the car just wouldn't start. 
and wouldn't start and wouldn't start. It was abandoned. And finally, we started looking everywhere. We looked by chance on the knees, and these marmots had come and had chewed on the tubes uh, of the transmission or something and had leaked all the fluid. <laughs> and so we had to go get a tow and tow the thing back out to town. It was horrible. But that didn't stop us from continuing to going camping. <laughs> so what we did is the next time we went camping, we just had to allot extra, a couple of extra hours to our camping schedule because as soon as we got to the uh, place where we parked, now we knew that these marmots were around and they liked fluid juice. They liked the fluid, the transmission fluid. <laughs> and they chewed up the wires, the, the, the tubes. So we went, you see, it's all full of uh, stones and um, rocks. So we gathered some from the boulder field, little, the little ones, and we just stuffed the car underneath the van. We stuffed the underneath of the van with stones so that the marmots couldn't get to the, to the tubes. It would take several hours, but then we felt confident that when we came back, we still had a functioning car, functioning van. So we used our own rocks that they used for, for hiding and defense to defend our own vehicle. Yes, the little creatures, but uh, they look like a lot of fun. Anyway, back to the stratigraphy, you can see uh, how it layers. And sometimes what you have is you have a river going through the sediment, carving a, an edge, carving a crater through the sediment. Typically, it is um, sedimentary rock, uh, silt, uh, ground up stone down to almost a powder, all right? And so it's fairly loose. It gives way, especially with water. Water is relentless. Water is incompressible, uh, liquid water. So when you have a river going through there for several hundred thousand years, it's going to generate a crater, all right? And then it exposes the layers. And this is just big heaven for, for um, geologists and uh, anthropologists and the, uh, the uh, people searching for uh, fossils, okay? You can see actually several layers here that have been uh, marked to measure some kind of a time frame. All right, so moving forward, let me talk a little bit about the half-life, which I've mentioned. These are minerals, these are elements that are found embedded in the sedimentary layers. And the half-life is the time that it takes for half of an isotope to decay to the next isotope. All right, now what are isotopes? These are elements in the periodic chart of the elements, the, the chemical chart, right? The periodic chart gives us all of the elements that are found in nature and then some that are made artificially. Uh, but basically, these are the elements uh, on Earth. And an element is defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. So if it has one proton, it's a helium, it's a hydrogen. If it has two, it is a helium. And if it has three, it's a uh, lithium and so on. So you can see that there is a number on top of the element. The elements represented typically by one letter, the more common ones, or sometimes two letters, if there's going to be ambiguity. And they're typically all uh, Latin names, all right? Latin names. So for example, sodium is Na, because sodium in Latin is natrium, natrium, <laughs> okay? And so forth. Uh, but you can see that on top of the letter, there is a number, and that is the number of protons. So protons have significant mass, whereas electrons uh, have insignificant mass, but they have charges. And protons have positive charge, uh, electrons have a negative charge, and so the electron is orbiting around the proton, uh, statistically forms the electron cloud. Back to the proton is the one that makes things heavy. So the one, the, 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 the thing that makes matter heavy uh, down to the atomic level is the proton because it has this significant mass, right? And so underneath the letter, you find the mass, uh, the mass weight, 
okay, which typically is uh, around uh, double the, the number of protons. So what makes the mass weigh double the number of protons? Okay, for example, already in helium, I don't know if you can see it from your plate, but helium has an atomic number of two, but an atomic mass of four. And then the, uh, the one under it, for example, neon, Ne, has an atomic mass, an atomic number of 10, but an atomic mass of about 20, right? So what makes that double, what makes the mass double the number, the atomic number for each element? There's some more stuff in the atom that is not protons because protons are the, is the atomic number. The other stuff is the neutrons, which don't have a charge, but do have mass, significant mass, and more or less approximately the same mass as the proton. And so when we have a proton and a neutron, right, what is the atomic number? We have one proton and one neutron, what is the atomic number? The atomic number is one because it's the number of protons. But the atomic mass is around two because it's the proton plus the neutron, okay? That's the mass. Okay, so bottom line is that um, protons can have uh, several neutrons attached to them. And that is what makes isotopes. Okay, that is what makes isotopes. Uh, it's in here somewhere, the word. So what happens with an isotope is that, for example, we, have, we can have carbon, which uh, normal carbon, the, what's the atomic number of carbon? Exactly, that's atomic. So how many protons in, in carbon? Six protons. But the atomic mass is 12, all right? Actually, that's an average because it's according to the percentage of isotopes. What happens is that um, 12 would indicate that it has six neutrons, all right? But we can also have carbon element, carbon with seven neutrons or eight neutrons which would make for carbon-13 or carbon-14, you see? So carbon-14 has eight neutrons, right? And then six uh, protons, which makes the, the, the 14. But it turns out that the, the extra neutrons are unstable. In other words, they, they leave the nucleus over time, over time. And it depends, each element has a different time for losing neutrons. So first of all, an element with different number of neutrons, that's called an isotope, okay, isotope. Now, uh, those different neutrons may or may not leave at a different time, but the rate, uh, that's called decay. When, when an isotope loses neutrons, it's called a decay because then it's going, let's say, from carbon-14 to carbon-13 and to carbon-12. It's losing um, neutrons, and that is called decay, all right? It turns out that the decay of the elements of the isotopes is measurable, and it's the same, again, universally. In other words, a carbon-14 atom uh, right here in Miami will decay at the same rate that a carbon-14 atom in Buenos Aires or in Timbuktu, which is actually a town in Africa, or in Beijing, all right? Those are four different carbon atoms because they're in four different places. They're both, they're all four carbon-14, and they will decay at the same rate to 13 to 12 in all those different places of the world and in different geological times also, whether it's today or a thousand years ago or a million years ago. So the rate of decay is constant for each element, but it's also different between each element. So some elements decay very fast, some isotopes decay very fast, and other elements decay very slowly. So you have a full range, but within the range, within the element, that decay 
is uniform, is consistent, and can be measured. And so it gives us a way of measuring and putting a date on the chronology of the strata, because these elements, of course, are, uh, occur naturally, and carbon is one of the most abundant elements in nature. And not only that, it's also organic, you see, because remember, to be a carbohydrate, to be an organic molecule, needs to have carbon and hydrogen. Of course, the hydrogen is gonna fly out into the atmosphere, but the carbon is gonna stick around. And so it is very interesting that carbon, isotopes that are radioactive, carbon-14, has a decay of about 6,000 years, the half-life, the half-life, all right? So here it is shown in a graph. If we start with 10 grams of carbon-14, Okay, in about 6,000 years more or less, or more accurate, in 5,730 years, those 10 grams have become five grams, meaning what has left is still carbon. So have the protons left? The protons have not left, the neutrons have left. Half of the neutrons have left, half of the neutrons, okay? because from 10 grams to five grams is half the quantity. So it's the decay, it's the weak force, and the atomic, the fundamental forces is the weak force because they're loosely attached. They're loosely attached and with time, they just fly out, <laughs> okay? Or they may get attracted by another atom that's next to them. And there's a dynamic interaction there, okay? But the, the point is that there is this decay that occurs in nature, it can be measured, and it's the weak force in contrast to the strong force, which is what's holding the, power, the protons together, all right? So the nuclear decay is, is the uh, weak force. All right, so this can be measured, and it, for carbon, it is uh, 5,730 years. So if we find a mass of carbon that weighs five grams. We know that five, 6,000 years ago that measured 10 grams <laughs> and so forth. So the bones of the fossils can be measured and estimate you know, how long ago they lived. They were more massive, literally massive, meaning they were more dense. And so the decay is a half-life. It's always the half amount, all right? So it's not linear, it is parabolic, all right? And it would approximate the x-axis, but it would never actually reach the x-axis, hypothetically, because it is parabolic, it's always taken in half. It's similar to that little trick of, if I am going to walk from here to the door, I'm always going to walk half of the previous distance, will I ever get to the door? Hypothetically, how many say yes, I'll get to the door, if I always ha walk half the distance toward the door? No, never get there, unsure? Well, you can figure it out because let's say I'm 10 uh, meters from the door, we'll put it in, in, in the metric system, which is easier to uh, fragment, right? So if I'm 10 meters from the door, my first walk is gonna be how many meters? Five meters, right? Now I'm five meters from the door, the next one is gonna be two and a half, and then one and a quarter, all right? Turn it into a fraction, one over half, one over four, one over eight, one over 16, right? So the denominator is always duplicating. By being a fraction, it's approximating uh, zero, but it never gets to zero <laughs> because the denominator keeps getting larger and larger. So that's the description of a parabola, right? Well, because the shoe, at some point, the, 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 the micronesimal space, my shoe is not able to walk that distance. You know, I'm not able to walk that tiny distance. And at some point, I'm going to make a mistake and hit the door with a shoe <laughs> or, the, or the toenail. But uh, mathematically, one would never get to the door. Never. Because the denominator is always duplicating. You see? And so it's approaching infinity but it never gets to infinity because it's infinity. <laughs> in other words, if you give me any, kind of, any amount of real number, make it the biggest real number you can think of, I can always give you one number larger than that, <laughs> right? And you can do the same. So 
here are the different half-lives for the different elements from uh, uh, one eighth of a second, right, which is lithium over there. Uh, lithium is the number four, right? Has, uh, two, no. Li below hydrogen. Three. Two, four. Wait, are you talking about the blue numbers or the protons? Li. Lithium. Three. Yeah, yeah. Three, three. Three protons. And then this one. Okay, so look at this. You can see it. Hopefully you can see it's not too small. This is very informative. So the subscript, Li is for lithium. is the third element on the periodic table. And that means that the atomic number is three. You can see the subscript three, tiny there. That's the number of what? Exactly. But the uh, atomic weight or the isotope, this one, lithium eight, is up here, all right? So that means that it has five neutrons and those neutrons decay very fast. They decay in less than a second, 0.8 seconds. Point, yeah, 0.8 seconds, okay? So lithium decays, lithium A decays very fast. If we find it in nature, it just decayed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Krypton, Krypton 89, look at how many isotopes it has because the atomic number is 36. So it's loaded with, ice, with uh, neutrons. It takes about three minutes to decay, the half-life to lose half of its neutrons, basically, to lose half. Sodium, 15 hours. Now we're getting into a manageable range. It depends what we're measuring. <clears throat> we're measuring a very fast reaction or we're measuring uh, other stuff, okay? <clears throat> so sodium decays in 15 hours. That's uh, the table of salt uh, that you have in your, that we have in our shelves, <laughs> the kitchen. Iodine in eight days. Iodine is used a lot in, uh, because it's a nice range of days. Um, iodine is used in the, in the lab for uh, following in vitro reactions and so forth. Cobalt, five years. Radium, 1,600 years. And uranium, 703 million years. So the radioactivity stays with it a lot. And that's why disposing of spent uranium that has also still some radioactivity, but not enough to fuel the power plant has to be stored for 700 million years before it stabilizes, <laughs> before it loses the radioactivity, right? So now the uh, level four plants, uh, radioactive plants, they, they have no nuclear waste. They recycle all this in the plant itself and it's used down to zero. Okay, those are the new generation uh, power plants. We'll get there. All right, so we can see, I'm giving you then the example here of how the stratigraphy can be measured. We can put a date on these layers, especially the carbon is very convenient because of the organic matter right, the fossilized, mineralized uh, organic material uh, from uh, the fossil record. Now, when we start putting that picture together, we notice that there, the, there are similarities between animals. You know, mammals look alike. Uh, we have four legs, four limbs. We have a head. We have a trunk region and so forth. We have fur. Um, Different uh, fish, different, very different fish look alike. Generally, they have a fin, they have this, the hydrodynamic uh, shape, they have gills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, different species of ship of fish have uh, similar shapes, and we can make that argument with all animals and plants of the world. There are a hundred different species of palms, but they are, all have palmate leaves, for example. They have a single trunk and so forth. They have a crown of leaves. And so mm, there are similarities and the original classification was done mostly by the morphology, by the external morphology 
of the plant or the animal or the fungus, and that's how they were classified originally, okay? And we see then that there has been branching with, when we put these groups of animals that look similar and we trace them back, we find this, uh, these branching um, events. These are called nodes. So this is a node, this is a node, this is a node, all right? And we go back in time, the nodes have a larger group of animals or plants so that, for example, in all of these, what do we have here? We have birds, we have reptiles, we have mammals, we have amphibians, and we have fish. And we notice that all of these different groups of individuals, different groups of uh, species, they all have one common characteristic, which is a spinal cord that is segmented, that is articulated. And so we call them the vertebrates, okay? And so vertebrate, uh, branching, excuse me, must have occurred early on before the other branching occurred. Because all of these, as diverse as they are, think of a tuna compared to a frog, compared to a pigeon or a gorrión, what is this? A, um, anyway, a bird, very different structures. Some swim, some fly, some hang from the trees, some live in the mud. Uh, and yet they all have an articulated backbone that we call a vertebral column, all right? So they must have derived from a common ancestor way back. Okay, moving forward, it turns out that, so if this is true, the fossil record should reflect this. The fossil record should reflect it. In other words, we should be able to find some fossils that have common characteristics, both let's say of birds and reptiles, which is a fairly recent branching, okay? And in fact, we find it. <laughs> Here is the fossil of the Archaeopteryx, all right? Well, you can see it is very obvious that this creature has four limbs, but it also has feathers. All right, and the forward limbs, what is known as the four limbs, F-O-R-E, the four limbs, the forward limbs, what we call the arms, are articulated and they have claws and digits, all right? Have you ever seen a modern bird with digits on, the, on their wings? No, but this guy had it and there it is. So this is a photograph, yes, but this is a photograph of a reconstruction of a model, all right? which what they do is they start with a skeleton and they reconstruct the skeleton and then they put muscle on the skeleton and then they put adipose tissue on the muscle and then they put skin on top of that adipose tissue and then they put feathers on top of that skin. And this is what some uh, archeologists and anthropologists and geologists uh, that work on this, all right? It's a whole science, uh, it's very sophisticated. It uses a lot of computers to make these three-dimensional diagrams and then to make the casts and the molds. Exciting, people spend their lifetime doing this. And this is the result of what an Archaeopteryx may look like anatomically. Now, what is a total imagination on this Archaeopteryx? The total imagination is going to be the color because we cannot get the color from the fossil record. But we can get the color from where? Not the animal kingdom, but the plant kingdom. In other words, the vegetation, the type of vegetation, and more or less assuming the coloration of the time, which is gonna be shades of green and brown, right? So for some kind of camouflaging, but also some kind of display for sexual selection, all right? Because that's what we see in the animals today of the coloration, which is involved, especially for vertebrates, but also in insects and many other animals that reproduce sexually. The coloration is gonna to have to do something with sexual selection, especially if the female is selecting on the male. Think of the peacock, for example, and the peahen, uh, but also camouflage, so it's a combination. Another interesting characteristic is 
that the archaeopteryx, when we look at the skull and the beak, what do we find? Teeth. When's the last time you saw a bird with teeth? Doesn't occur. <laughs> okay, but these are teeth. And further, these are homodonts. Homodonts are like little cones and they're all alike. All of the teeth are basically alike. So these are called homodonts, they're similar. And we have that same characteristic with reptiles today. I think of the teeth of an alligator, they're more or less the same little cones, all right? Uh, and um, we don't have homodonts, we have heterodonts. In other words, we have different types of teeth for different functions. Molars for grinding, uh, canines for cutting, incisors for, or canines for tearing and incisors, the front teeth for clipping and so forth. So our jaw, our, our teeth are heterodonts, different shapes for different functions. It's a further specialization. Originally, they started as homodonts, just the same function, just kind of when you get the prey, hold on to it, don't lose the prey, <laughs> okay? So you can see more primitive homodonts are before antecessors to heterodonts. Yes, it does. So we could say that the phoenix looks like the archaeopteryx, right? Yeah. Exactly, and there it is. So, but the phoenix actually is an actual bird phoenix. The phoenix is a mythological figure, yeah. right? Which is from Greek mythology that arises from the, yeah. now they give us, yeah, arises from the ashes, now it gives us the city, and one phoenix bird, <laughs> or God. Yes. Exactly, yes, which uh, is being interpreted as a, an eagle eating a snake. El águila y la serpiente is in the, in the emblem of the, of the flag of Mexico because it was a Maya, not Maya actually, it was Aztec. It was the Aztec belief that the snake eating, the, the eagle eating the snake, that's where they had to settle. All right, and that's where they build the Gran Tenochtitlan, uh, which is the big city in the center of Mexico City, right? Underneath the Zócalo is the Tenochtitlan, and there's, they have found one pyramid there um, that is excavated and can be uh, visited. So it's a mythological figure, right? Uh, but typically it's some kind of a bird of prey. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we see that in the fossil record, it is uh, corroborating these common ancestors. And it is thought today that the birds derive from the reptiles, basically. So they're winged reptiles. One way of looking at birds is that they are winged reptiles. At least they have a common ancestor and here's a graphic representation of one. Uh, another one in, in mammals is the horse. We go back to the Eohippus or the, the original horse, which was then renamed into Hyracotherum. Hyracotherum was what they call the dwarf horse, was more the size of a dog, okay? That was the original uh, horse or uh, ancestor of the horse. And we can follow this mostly through the foot. All right, and the, the claw, the claw, the hoof, because they have their feet of the original, the, what used to know, be known as the uh, Eohippus, the first uh, horse, but now we have renamed it to Hiracotherum. All right, the Hiracotherum, these are fossil records that have been found of their hoofs. They had four toes, four toes, all right? And then some of these toes started getting degenerate or actually what happened was uh, some of the toes became longer or it was an adaptation that the longer toe had an advantage, had a survival advantage. And so there's a whole transition that has been found of these, of these uh, limbs 
so that the central toe kept getting larger and larger, and it's the one that was hitting the ground more often, so the other toes became degenerate, what we call vestigial, to the point that today modern horse is walking on the middle toe, on the middle finger only, all right? All four hooves, and it's just the middle finger, and the, and the hoof is actually the nail, which has become super thick because it has to hold the weight of the whole horse, at least one quarter of the weight. It's threaded into the four legs. So the other four um, fingers, toes are there, but they're degenerate. They're just little slivers of uh, calcium. And the bottom line is that these, uh, the horses and the donkeys and all these uh, zebras that walk on their toe, on a single middle toe, and on the hoof of the toe, which is the nail, and nail in Italian, in Latin is called uña, and so these are the ungulates. The ungulates are the ones who walk on their nails, <laughs> all right? And so uh, archeologists have found all these fossils of the transition from the El Hippos all the way to the modern horse, okay? And it goes back to about 55 million years ago. Yes, the carbon-14 embedded in those fossilized bones. Interesting. So based on that fossil evidence, one can generate a cladogram. These are called cladograms, a branching diagram, which has all the modern species of the ungulates, right? Here's uh, Cavallus, the horse. Uh, here's a zebra, Grey, Grey is the zebra. Uh, Somaliensis, these are uh, Anasinus, these are the donkeys. <laughs> okay. And the Onager, this is an African uh, uh, ungulate. These are all existing today, modern, but they're all related. And so each one of the red numbers is a node, all right? It's a node. And this that cladogram actually has eight nodes. Actually, it should have nine nodes because this is the first node here. It's so obvious that they missed it. <laughs> but uh, this is the first node where equals, the original equals, this uh, uh, dog shape, uh, hippos, right, um, branched to two branches first, and then each branch continued to branch, but these are dated according to the fossil record. And there have been eight branches to get to the current distribution of, um, of ungulates in the world, okay? And they're across, they're across the globe. They are in Africa, they are in Asia, they are in Europe, and they're also in America, in the two continents. So they have managed, the, all of this occurred before the continental drift of the, of the continents, before the continents separated from one big, huge landmass, which was called Pangea. I have a slide on that. All right, let me see something from them because I'm noticing it's already 11 o'clock. I can't believe this. <laughs> uh, I want to see where we're at here to take the break. Oh, yeah at least to comparative embryology. We're getting there. So more evidence on the, um, when we classify the species with the binomial linear and classification taxonomy, we can make this scheme that I've presented to you before, uh, the largest one being domain. And there are three domains currently on earth, right? The um, archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes, uh, animals and plants and fungi with a true nucleus. And those three domains are subdivided into six main kingdoms. And the six kingdoms are subdivided into about three dozen phyla, one phylum, several phyla. Okay, so about three dozen phyla. Then by the time we get to class, there are hundreds of classes, thousands of orders, hundreds of thousands of families, or maybe dozens of thousands of families. And then by the time we get to genus and species, we're to two million species that have been classified so far, 
which the scientists estimate that there may be anywhere between uh, uh, 10 to 20 million species on Earth. And so we'll only discover about 5 or 10 percent of the species, okay? I've mentioned that the other species we haven't discovered yet typically are microscopic, maybe unicellular, and uh, typically they'll be at the bottom of the ocean somewhere in the sediment there, which will be very rich. Uh, we're beginning to get there with some robots. All right, moving forward then, this classification uh, is based on common ancestors, common characteristics. Of course, these are all living species, but the common characteristics uh, are pointing the character, the similarity between a zebra and a horse just begs the question that they have a common ancestor, all right? And when that is confirmed with the fossil record, then we're onto something here. Another line of evidence for um, evolution, which kind of dovetails with the common ancestor uh, concept is this, what we call structural, structural homologies, okay? Homologies. Let's look at these four mammals. Bats are mammals, whales are mammals, cats are mammals, and so are we. When we look at the forelimb, F-O-R-E, right, the forelimb, in other words, the, the arms of these four mammals, we notice that they have very different purpose. For example, we use our arms for grasping. Cats use their forward limbs for walking and running. Whales use their forward limbs for gliding through the water and bats use their forward limbs for flying. So four different, very distinct functions. But the structure is very similar. The structure has uh, all of the structures of the bones of the forearm are there in all four mammals, even though their function is very different. As I'm showing here, the humerus, starting from the shoulder down, the humerus is the longest bone there, uh, or the single bone, right, is in the human, in the cat, in the whale, and in the bat. Also, the radius and the ulna here in the, in the uh, extension of the arm, articulated at the shoulder, at the uh, elbow, it's in all four mammals all the way down to the carpals and metacarpals, what makes up our palm, and down to the digits, the fingers, which are known as phalanges, and they're also articulated, all right? They're articulated. For us, it's a big deal because we use our hands for grasping, so the fingers better be articulated. But a cat doesn't really need articulated digits as such, as long as there's a pad and a, a place on which to uh, land and crawl, right? A whale, why will a whale need articulated digits inside the fin? Again, the bat is very convenient for the digits to be articulated because the wing is retractable and expandable and so forth. And it has the thumb is sticking out for grasping also <laughs> with a nail on it. So they can also cling and hang and spend the night or spend the day sleeping uh, wrapped up in their wings. All right, so you notice very different functions, but the structure are adaptations of the same basic structure. So it begs the question, there must be some ancestor that had a basic forelimb or forward arm and that has adapted to these four different functions. In fact, all of these, as you know, are mammals. And so we are tetrapods. We have four legs, four limbs. We have hind limbs and we have four limbs, right? And then you can play with that. You can say that, yes, that two of our four limbs are four limbs and the other two are hind limbs. <laughs> okay. Levity for a moment. Finally, I'll stop with this, which is comparative embryology. Already a century ago, the, the um, embryos were being studied of different animals, okay? And it was noted that 
the embryos also had some similarity to them, morphological similarity. What I mean by morphological is just their shape, their anatomy, the external anatomy, all right? Morphological similarity so that they could be lined up. And it was noticed that early on in the embryonic development, these embryos were more similar across different species. So for example, a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chick, a bird, uh, and these are all mammals, the pig, the calf, the rabbit, and the human, right? They all had similar anatomy, similar morphology. The earlier the embryo, the more similar they were. So for example, at, at some early stage, they all had a tail, including the human. Where's our tail? Well, our tail is tucked into the coccyx, into the tailbone, and if we ever fell on our rear, you know we have a tailbone, all right? But they're fused, and these are vestigial. They were absorbed by the body. We absorb, but early in embryonic stage, we have the a tail bud, all right, that is there. We also have the, what is known as pharyngeal pouches or gill slits. We don't know, we don't have the actual gills behind it, but we have the slits. I have another slide on that. Uh, uh, further down. Anyway, we have these common characteristics across very different uh, uh, animals, all the way from mammals to birds to reptiles, amphibians, and to fish. Then as the embryonic, develop embryonic development occurs, we become more distinct, all right? But the characteristics remain in the same general group. So fish, and salamander are still looking together to the point, looking similar to the point that even when uh, salamanders and frogs are born, they're born as tadpoles and they have a tail and they have gills, which are then shed when the, when the uh, juvenile passes on to be an adult, the tail is lost or reabsorbed, the gills are shed and legs grow, four legs. Mm -hmm. And so the amphibian shows in their real life the transition from a fish morphology to a tetrapod, to a land morphology, okay? Uh, similar between reptiles and birds. So that's pointing to a common ancestor in that branch. And then between the different mammals also, fairly good similarity uh, during the embryonic stage, even all the way close to uh, birth, okay? And uh, related to that, and I'll stop uh, with this since I mentioned it already, is this whole issue of vestigial structures. Structures that we have in our body that have no function, no current function, but are there. How did they get there? Why would God, you know, capriciously give us a coccyx and appendix that can kill us when, when it becomes inflamed and infected uh, if there's no real purpose to it? A more logical explanation is that it's something that is remaining, right, vestiges of a functional structure in some ancestor. It makes more sense. That makes God a little more benevolent than just putting a structure in us that can potentially kill us, okay, capriciously. All right, so these are vestigial structures. They're rudimentary organs. They don't have a function anymore or they may acquire a secondary function like the appendix, which now apparently has developed a secondary function and is somehow associated with the immune system. The appendix, the appendix, with right? The what with the immune system. But it's a secondary function, we call it opportunistic. In other words, it hung around long enough. So nature kind of develops a, a function or a, um, serendipity, you know, it turns out that uh, it develops a secondary function that is now assisting in the immune system, okay? But uh, for example, the pelvic bones of a whale, why the pelvic bones are associated with the hind limbs, precisely with growing legs. And where are the legs of the whale? Well, they're gone because this used to be land mammals that migrated to the sea. They came up they came from the sea, from marine, they came to land, they hung around for a while, didn't like it and went back to the sea and they felt better there and got bigger, uh, but they still have their vestigial um, pelvic bones uh, 
which have no real function. In fact, it's actually a hindrance in trying to get the calf out through that pelvic uh, uh, girdle, all right? So, but it's vestigial. It used to have a function when these, when the ancestors were on land, land tetrapods that remigrated back to the ocean. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there for a moment. Since it's a quarter after 11, let's take a little break and uh, we'll come back. Let's see, we have gone through the fossil records, morphological similarities, how to date the fossil record, uh, stratigraphy, half-life, mm, morphological similarities, and the cladograms, the branching of the fossil record to current species, comparative embryology, and we're now talking about the stigial structures, okay? So we're gonna stop here for a moment. Uh, how about we come back at uh, 11.30? All right, so Chris and Jordan will reconnect at 11.30. I'm gonna pause now so that uh, we don't have that blank in the recording. Hold on a second. Okay, recording. I was mentioning the word paucity. You hear the paucity of the fossil record which will apply and it will be significant when we talk about the, the uh, human fossil record, okay? The human fossil record and the paucity of it. In other words, that we only have a few individuals that show up in the fossil record. Most of those, uh, most of the other individuals that were living along the time of these creatures um, did not leave a fossil record behind or we haven't found it yet. Okay, so we're constantly discovering fossils, but the point is that uh, there's still a paucity as, as many fossils that we have today throughout the world that is minuscule compared to the number of creatures that were existing that were living at that time back then. Okay, so we have the skeleton of a few uh, dozen fish, the, the fossils of a few dozen fish. We can estimate that there were hundreds or thousands of fish uh, swimming around at that time when this one died, and this is the one that we found, mm -hmm. or this is the one that got fossilized. Many animals did not get fossilized. The vast majority of them, more than 99% of them, just got crunched and, and pulverized with the rest of the uh, sedimentary material wherever they died. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, a concept to keep in mind, the paucity of the fossil record that with very few fossils, we're trying to make some conclusions out of it. Also, with regards to the, here where I had left off with the comparative embryology, there's also a little dictum that I remember hearing when I was a, high, a, a teenager in high school biology, uh, ontogeny and phylogeny, all right? That ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This is under comparative embryology. This is Heckel's uh, phrase. Ernst Heckel was uh, a zoologist in um, Darwin's time. He's uh, German, he was German. And he had this little phrase, ontology recapitulates phylogeny. Mm -hmm. I have it in your, your diagram there, in your outline number three. What did he mean? He was looking at this, that the Development of the individual, that is ontogeny, the origin and development of the individual, that is ontogeny, right? Recapitulates phylogeny, follows the stages of the whole group. The origin and development of the individual follows the same stages of the whole group. What does that mean functionally? It means this, that for example, for humans, when we go through our embryonic development, early on, we're picking up common characteristics of our ancestors. And so we go through the stages of the whole group of mammals and the whole group of vertebrates, precisely with the gill slits and tail. And those are the two most obvious characteristics morphologically, because we find that even birds, reptiles, fish, amphibians, they also have the same characteristics. 
So that's what he meant by phylogeny is the development of the whole group, origin and development of the whole group, okay? So this ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny has been disproven. It was very instrumental. It conveyed a concept of evolution. It was like saying basically in our embryonic development, in the embryonic development of every creature, we find evolution, if you will. We find like a summary, a recap of the evolutionary process of that species. Well, it turns out that in the broad sense, in a very broad sense, yes, but no, not really. Ontogeny does not recapitulate phylogeny, okay? Why? Well, it would mean that if we take it in the strict sense of ontogeny recapitulate phylogeny, it would mean that we humans, for example, or any mammal, early on in the embryonic development, first we'll fish, then we're amphibians, then we're reptiles, then we're birds, and then finally in the late embryonic stages, we become mammals, which is not true because we're always of the same species and of the same group, okay? So this ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which I'm telling you, I heard in my lifetime when I was a teenager in high school, biology back in Mexico City, all right, um, was a dictum up until 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. But no, in the strict sense, it's not true because there's no saltation, there's no jumping from one species to another during embryonic development. We're always of the same species, but we have common characteristics, which points to common ancestors, right? But there's no jumping, there's no saltation or jumping from one species to another. That is uh, just not biological. And it has to do, of course, with the genome, that the genome is unique to each species. Common characteristics, yes. More primitive characteristics early on, yes. All right. Uh, what else do I need to clarify? Oh, yes. So common descent, right? The branch in evolution, this uh, is speaking to what we call a common descent, that all these descendants have a common ancestor. So it depends on which way you're going on the cladogram. If you're going toward the branching of the current species, then that's common descent, right? They all descend, all these descendants, all these ungulates descend from a common ancestor. Or if you're going up the branches to the trunk, then you talk about uh, a common ancestor. And then there's a further refinement, the nearest common ancestor, the NEA, right? The NEA or NCA, I'm sorry, is the nearest common ancestor. So that would be the nearest node. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a number two in the, uh, in the uh, uh, diagram in the uh, handout that I gave you. Okay. Nearest common ancestor, NCA, you see this sometimes in, uh, in the books. It would be essentially the node. So this node here, number three, is the nearest common ancestor to Onager and Kian. Right, Ekus Onager and Ekus Kiang, which I believe they're both from uh, Africa. The nearest common ancestor is whatever creature was here at, at the node before the branching. And so forth, so each node really is the nearest common ancestor to uh, the previous one. Another term here, oh yes, so this morphological similarity also there on number two of the handout, the morphological similarity that I was talking about, this happens, uh, this homology happens structurally, functionally, molecularly, and behaviorally, All right? So those four areas, those four areas, we have homology, we find homology. We find homology in structures, as for example, the forward limbs of these four mammals. Okay. We find homology in the physiology or physiological pathways, the metabolism. Mm -hmm. We find homology at the molecular level, and that's the more sophisticated one where we're gonna get at percentage homology in the DNA or in the protein sequence. 
And we also find homology in the behavioral level. So for example, all cats are top carnivores, whether it's a lion, a tiger, the neighborhood cat, or a lynx, or a puma, or a jaguar, all right, or a bobcat, which they used to be, before we got here, they used to be bobcats in this area, that's where it's our mascot. <laughs> they all hunt, they're top carnivores, all right? And that's all they eat is, is uh, meat, unless they need to purge their stomachs, and then sometimes they eat grass to regurgitate. <laughs> but usually they're, they're, they're hunters, they're top carnivores, so that's a behavioral pattern. And they'll hunt in prides, or they'll hunt in, in groups in the wild. So again, the homology is going to occur, or the similarities will occur, not only at the structural level, but also physiologically, right? In pathways, in metabolism. It's going to occur at the behavioral level, and it's going to occur in molecular homology. OK, so that's picking up from uh, before the break. Now, moving forward, I talked about vestigial structures already. A little more detail here. Uh, our, Examples of uh, what I was mentioning earlier in the comparative embryology. Here are embryos of fish, reptile, bird, and human pointing the tail early on, which then gets reabsorbed in the human, but sticks around in the other three. And then also the gill slits or gill pouches, right, which develop into true gills, both in fish and in amphibians, but in amphibians it's only temporary. But you notice the slit is one thing and the actual gill structure behind it is different. It's a, difference, it's, it's a different structure. Whereas these gill slits in uh, reptiles, birds, and uh, mammals become different parts of the jaw and also various bones of the, of the hearing. Okay, and even the glottis here, the little casing that holds the vocal cords, okay, that we can feel with our hand, those are what becomes part of these gill slits for non fish and non amphibians. All right, so then uh, moving forward, another area is this uh, biogeography. Biogeography is finding similar species in different continents altogether. For example, the very well-known case of the uh, dromedaries or the camelids. The camelids are dromedaries, camels, and llamas. Okay, the llama from South America. The uh, camel from uh, uh, Asia and the dromedary also from Asia and parts of Africa. And no camelids in the United States or in North America currently, because basically the belief is that they were hunted down, all right? They made fairly easy prey. They're herbivores, but they're large, so they have relatively large meat mass. And they were basically hunted down to extinction, but the origin was thought to be really in North America, what is today North America of the ancestor camelid. And then they migrated to South America and to Eurasia through the Bering Strait, yes, during one of these winterizations where there was a bridge there, okay? And so even in South America, they specialized even further into various different species along the Andes mostly so we have the llama, the vicuña, the guanaco, the alpaca, all those are different camelids. Smaller, but they have the same basic anatomy. And then in uh, Asia, when you, uh, the dromedaries and the camels, which by the way, there's no water in there on the hump, okay? It's mostly fat tissue <laughs> that they use for storing uh, energy. So the one hump is a dromedary and the two hump is a camel. I always get them backwards. <laughs> That's uh, with regards to the humps. Anyway, uh, they have very similar anatomy and uh, they have a common ancestor that actually originated most likely in what is today North America. 
in the North American continents. So this migration also speaks of uh, a geographical migration and then eventual isolation, which allows for speciation. In other words, there's, there's no more, the, the diversity becomes reduced, the variety uh, becomes reduced, and so that could lead to uh, speciation. And this leads on to the next topic of the geographical isolation. So the continents have also been shifting and it's called continental drift, right? We'll see later uh, in the environmental course how the origin of the earth was mostly a process of accretion. In other words, gathering mass from other massive bodies that were flying around at uh, some incredible speed and started coalescing, of course, with the force of gravity that attracted even more masses. So it was in a synergistic process of attracting chunks of matter from rocks and boulders or material matter uh, is flying around in space that got trapped into the orbit and, and collapsed into the, uh, into the core of what eventually became Earth and the other planets around the sun and other solar systems is, is a similar process uh, at the local level of each planet is called accretion. Anyway, mm, at first it's just a magma is very hot and it's molten lava. So it's mostly all that mass, all that material is in a liquid, thick liquid state, but through uh, radiation, we radiate out heat. So heat, which is that um, uh, second law of thermodynamics of uh, entropy, right? We lose heat to the universe and so planets invariably cool because they're opaque, they're not luminous bodies, and so they cool down. And as they cool, we get a differentiation of layers so that there will be a core, there will be a mantle, and then there will be a crust, all right? And the crust starts solidifying as it cools, and eventually it will become cool enough to hold liquid water, which has to be in the range between zero and 100 centigrade. So it's a very particular range of temperature, which is a fairly low temperature in the universe, okay? Uh, it's typically temperature in the hundreds of, uh, hundreds of degrees or thousands of degrees above or below, depending on where we stand uh, next to the luminous bodies like the sun. But the earth then, like other planets, uh, have developed a crust over millions of years, billions. And that crust was literally just one big chunk, one big scab, if you will, all right, which was called Pangea, which Gea is a reference to Geos, to Earth. Uh, all this comes from the Greeks. And Pan is all, all Earth was one big chunk of crust, right? And it goes back only 225 million years ago, not even one bit, a quarter of a billion years ago. All right, so it took the Earth more than three billion years, three billion and three quarter billion years to cool down enough to have a crust. Before then, it was mostly magma, molten ball of uh, red hot uh, molten lava that was totally inhospitable. And that's why the primitive atmosphere is so different than today's atmosphere because it was all the gases that was coming out of this molten lava, all right? But eventually through the dissipation of heat radiating out in all directions, some area starts cooling down enough to form a crust, okay? And that crust is uh, this uh, huge section, originally called Pangea, which then starts fragmenting and sliding. You can think of like a raft, all right, on top of molten lava that is wiggling around a little bit. And first it cracks into two main areas. Laurasia, which is the northern continent, more or less around the equator, and then Gongwana land or Gongwana, which was going to be the south. So the north is going to contain North America, the North American continent, uh, uh, Europe, and Asia. And that's why the original name Laurasia. And Gongwana land is going to contain what is today South America, Africa, Antarctica. India, 
and, uh, and Australia. So pretty much everything that is south on the equator. So these two chunks, as the Earth continues to cool and to move because of something called seafloor spreading and the Coriolis effect of the magma, of the lava underneath the continents is shifting them around. Again, very, very slowly, but significantly. So it has been measured. We are drifting away from Europe, for example, North America, the, the East Atlantic and the West Atlantic coast are drifting away from each other, Europe away from North America at about two or three inches a year which is very significant, that measurement. And that can be done with laser beams from satellites and they can measure it very precisely, okay? Um, so these continents are still shifting around and about 100 million years ago, we already had the distinct continent that we have today, but in different shapes. Imagine, for example, Asia and Europe are still one, uh, were one uh, single landmass, it's called Eurasia. Then uh, North America is a plate already, which includes what is today Canada and Greenland. And also sticking out on the other side is uh, what is today Alaska. But you know that South America is down here. They were not connected originally. North and South America were not connected. It was a chunk from Africa that came out of Africa. And India is down here. It hasn't even moved across the equator yet, all right? Uh, Australia and Antarctica were still one big chunk about 100 million years ago. Then today we fast forward to the plates that we have today. So this, all this movement is called plate tectonics, plate tectonics and the theory of continental drift, which has already been uh, confirmed by various uh, sources, including the magnetic drift, magnetic shift of the poles um, along the ocean floor. And as the ocean sea floor spreading, as the ocean floor migrates also uh, horizontally from east to west. So these are the continents today. Look at um, North America and South America become joined by Mesoamerica and mostly Central America, right? Down to the sliver of Panama, which is just a horizontal S shape, a uh, little ridge of land that came up from the ocean floor and sealed off the Thetis Sea. The Thetis Sea used to be what is now the Caribbean in the Gulf of Mexico, that used to be a sea that connected the Atlantic and the Pacific. And then at some point uh, in the last hundred million years, these two so this was called the Thetis Sea. These two continents came together and formed a barrier, a dam in between the Atlantic and the Pacific, all right? What today we call the Caribbean. Mm. Another movement that was uh, even more drastic was uh, India. So India came as a chunk from Antarctica down there near the Southern Pole and started migrating north because of this continental drift and plate tectonics and essentially crashed into Southeast Asia and continues to push to this day into Southeast Asia embedding itself into Southeast Asia, buckling up the whole continent and generating the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, but this is this. So the mountains are coming by buckling up of continents of plate tectonics crashing with each other and just pushing forward up, okay? At the opposite end, something else has to counterpart that motion, which is going into the, um, into the magma at the edge. For example, what is happening with uh, California and Oregon, the West Coast in general, we have the buckling of the um, Rocky Mountains, but then on the ocean, it drops very fast there because there is a crevice that goes down into the magma and ocean and land are going slowly into the earth and getting re-liquefied by the magma, right? And becomes part of the magma again, and it will rotate, we'll have that Coriolis rotation like that. And at some other, other edge of the, of the uh, magma flow, magma is actually coming out from the ocean floor up into the surface and cooling off. And those are the underwater volcanoes that have been experienced in Hawaii and areas like that, that you see the actual red hot magma coming out to the ocean floor and connecting with, the, with water is uh, dramatic. Anyway, 
uh, we'll look at it in the environmental course a little more in detail. But basically, the seafloor spreading only 100 million years ago, we had species that go back two and 300 million years. So basically, already Pangaea was populated with plants and animals. Okay, and all of a sudden, these plants and animals got fragmented and got uh, segmented and isolated into different continents. So that's the geographical isolation at the big picture at the level of the continent. To the point that today, this has um, contributed to what we call biodiversity and biogeography. And we have essentially about mm, between nine and 12 biomes, right? But nine biomes that make up all of the land masses of the world from the tropical rainforest to the temperate regions, whether it's savanna, desert, or temperate forest, like in, in North America and South America, all the way up to the Arctic regions, the coniferous uh, forests of uh, Canada and Siberia, right? And so we have all of these different layers. These are the different names of the um, of the vegetation of the biomes. Remember the biome is the largest classification, uh, geographical classification of living things on earth. And uh, we see that there's a swath, a horizontal swath that matches uh, the different continents with the same biome. So for example, tropical rainforest, right? In uh, along the equator, whether it's South America or Mesoamerica, including the Caribbean and the tip of uh, Florida here that we call South Florida, across to Southeast Asia, which is very tropicalized, and even into equatorial Africa. This is gonna be the Congo Basin, which is the other lung of the world, the two big lungs of the world, the Congo Basin and the Amazon, right? And then if we move mostly north because south, for a little while, but then we run out of land mass. So you notice this line here is the equator and most of the land mass on the earth today is up in the Northern hemisphere, okay? As we move north, we go into the temperate region and then eventually into the Arctic, subarctic and Arctic. So this is a coniferous uh, forest here of uh, pine trees, okay? But and they go across the continents the same type of biome in different continents. So this has allowed for uh, regional biodiversity. For example, we find a similar species and that belong to the same group. It is evident that different palms, I mentioned we are, there are about 100 palm tree uh, species of palms uh, today, which by the way, Fairchild has one of the largest virtual tropical gardens down in South Miami as one of the largest uh, palm collection in the world. Mm, Freestanding palms. Uh, Fairchild Tropical Garden down by Matheson Hammock. Again, uh, Old Cutler, the area of Pinecrest, South Miami. Okay, uh, Dayland Mall. Very <laughs> good landmark. That's Kendall Drive. You continue Kendall Drive going west, going east. It becomes residential, just uh, six lane down to two lanes, uh, both ways, all the way down to the coast, right? The old Cutler Road there near Coconut Grove. Uh, but if you go south, there is this park called Fairchild Tropical Gardens. David Fairchild, uh, yes, it's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it's worthwhile. David Fairchild was a botanist about 100 years ago in the 1920s and 1930s. He went around the world collecting nuts of palms and planting them in that area. And now these palms are all super established uh, from all over the world, okay? And so, but what I wanted to mention about palms is that we have fossil palms, right? And we have palms in South America, we have palms in Africa, we have palms in Asia, and we have the introduced palms here in North America because of our subtropical climate in South Florida but they all come from common ancestor. And how come they are in all these different continents? And even way far inland, where there's nowhere near the coast, because if it was a coconut, you say, oh, well, they floated there, right? Yeah, but 
we're talking miles and hundreds of miles inland uh, in all of these uh, continents, and they are all palms coming from originally a common ancestral palm. So it's pointing out to the fact that the palms developed before Pangaea fragmented because they're found in all the continents of the world. All right, so they are older than 100 million years ago or 200 million years. Okay, mm, some other evidence. Okay, now we're gonna get into the molecular homology. Let me see if I have some key terms here. So on the biogeography here in the handout, you can see dispersal, the theory of continental drift and plate tectonics that I talked about. Discontinuous distribution, again, because there will be barriers, natural barriers between the continents, things like oceans and mountain ranges and so forth that make barriers in the terrain. And so it allows for isolation, geographical isolation, which is one of the main drivers of speciation because there's less mix. You see, there's no mix. The, the gene, um, uh, gene flow stops or gets uh, localized. And finally, the most mm, evident evidence, so the, 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 the best evidence, the fullest evidence that we have for pointing at evolution is what we call molecular homology. Remember that I mentioned homology is at the anatomical level excuse me, at the physiological level, metabolism, at the uh, behavioral level, and also at the molecular level, all right? So this is stuff since the 1960s, basically, 1970s, uh, with, the, with DNA as the universal molecule of inheritance and the deciphering of the protein sequences and the, the genetic code of the triplets. So basically, now molecular biologists can put together a cladogram that is much more accurate because it's not based on just external anatomy, but it's based on molecular uh, evidence, on molecular homology. So if we were to base it only on external anatomy, we would maybe put the bat as a bird because it's got wings, but it's not a bird, it's a mammal. Okay, so we have to look deeper. And the deeper we look is at the molecular level. And we find what is known as percentage homologies, all right? So we can talk about the amino acid sequence. Remember, proteins are made up of amino acids, a chain of amino acids. But we know that the amino acid is reflected in the genetic code. And there was three uh, nucleotides, three base pairs, three bases code for one amino acid in what is known as the genetic code. And so if we take a protein and we decipher its amino acid sequence, then we can tell what is the genetic code for that protein. We can decipher what is the, the genetic code, what is the DNA code, what is the gene for that sequence, all right? And then we can compare sequences of genes, whether it's at the level of the amino acids or at the level of the a DNA and come up with what we know as percentage homology, percentage homology, right? So here is a um, comparative homology between the human and other species, other animals. Of course, we are 100% compatible to each other as humans at the molecular level of our DNA, of our polypeptides, right? Oh, sorry, this is a human hemoglobin. So all human hemoglobin has the same sequence, essentially, right? Except for the SNPs, the little fingerprinting that we have. Uh, but the general, in the big picture, the sequence is about 100% compatible. This is hemoglobin now, right? The RBCs. When we compare our hemoglobin to the rhesus monkey hemoglobin, it's 95% compatibility, 95% homology. In other words, there's only 5% difference in the genetic code or the amino acid, the polypeptides, the amino acid sequence of rhesus uh, hemoglobin and human hemoglobin. 
So it's a very high match. And that's why the rhesus monkey has been used in labs in the past for doing uh, trials in uh, drug discovery and um, development because they have very similar blood to ours. In fact, there's a particular factor there that is on the hemoglobin precisely. Have you ever heard of Rh positive or Rh negative, which is in addition to the blood type? So the blood type is either A or B or AB or O, right? Which O is actually a zero, means no. So there are two proteins on the hemoglobin uh, of uh, humans. On the RBC, there are two proteins on the, on the membrane. One protein is just called protein A and the other protein is called protein B. So A type people, you know your, you, do you know your blood type? Yeah, I'm O, right? A, okay. Emilio, no, you don't know it? Okay, you know your blood type? O, okay. Most people are O. A is rare, all right? But that means that you have the A protein on the, uh, on the surface of your RBCs, all right? And uh, let's assume that you are B, right? So you have the B protein, but you don't have the A and you don't have the B. But then, uh, so let me see, Jordan or Chris, you know your, your blood type? I'm all positive. So no, no? Okay, find out. <laughs> positive, all positive. Oh, you are all positive, that's Jordan, okay. Chris, you don't know yours, no? Okay, you should find out what your blood type is because whenever you need a transfusion, <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> so this is what happens. In A type people, you have the A protein. B type, you have the B protein. A, B, what do they have? They have both proteins. They have A and B protein, okay? And us O, we have zero. We have no protein, none of those. We don't have the A or the B protein on our RBCs, all right? So when it comes time for a transfusion, um, a type people can receive blood from whom? You can receive from A and you can receive from O because O doesn't have any protein. But you can receive from B because your, your, uh, your immune system will detect that as a foreign body and will start agglutinating it and form clots. And that's not a good thing to have clots inside the body. And so, what about the one that has AA? exactly. So A cannot receive from B or from AB. B can receive from B and O, but cannot receive from A or AB because of the A factor. Then AB can receive from A, B, AB, and O. AB can receive from O, so that's why they call the universal recipients because they can receive any type of blood. O, uh oh, <laughs> O, o, o cannot receive from A, cannot receive from B, cannot receive from AB, can only receive from O, which doesn't have the protein, all right? So we're called the universal donor because we can give blood to anybody, but we can only receive from O type. However, thanks be to God that proportionally in the proportion of the population through evolutionary process, uh, the most common type of blood is O type. So statistically, on any random sample of blood type of a pint of blood from, a, from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the blood bank, they called me just two days ago again to donate blood. <clears throat> on average, they'll have more O type blood. You see, because on average on, on any hundred people, there will be 60 of those people will be all type or 65, I think, something like that, all right? <clears throat> so there's generally in the blood bands, there's more all type blood, which is the universal donor. So you see how things compensate. Anyway, there's another protein, there's another factor. Typically, when we talk about factors, we're talking about proteins. Uh, it can be something else, but generally we refer to proteins. There's another factor in the blood, in addition to the type, which is called the RH factor. Ever heard of the RH factor? And that one is either positive or negative. So we are either RH positive or RH negative. The RH is a protein that the rhesus monkey has. And the genus is RH, R-H-E-S-U-S. -S. So that's where the RH comes from, from rhesus. 
because this protein was discovered in the hemoglobin. It's a polypeptide, it's a hemoglobin of resource that is very similar to the human. And so we either have that resource protein or we don't have it. So it's a third protein, if you will, okay? But it's called RH instead of calling it C because it was discovered in the rhesus monkey. Anyway, so that one we either have or not, and that's a different factor. So uh, here it is, 95% compatible with the rhesus. 87% with the mouse. That's also why the mouse is a good model for um, the lab because it has a high percentage of homology in its biochemistry, all right? We're 69% with chicken <laughs> blood, 54% <laughs> with a frog blood, <laughs> and 14% with a lamprey. You know what a lamprey is? It's a type of fish, <laughs> right? It looks like an eel and it swims and it's uh, parasitic and it's invasive and it's uh, gone into the uh, Great Lakes and it's chewing up, it attaches on fish on the side and it sucks other juices and it's bad news, but it's basically a type of uh, fish, very primitive. And we have 14% uh, homology with their hemoglobin. <laughs> so this percentage homo homology is pointing to the obvious that there's a common polypeptide that originated in hemoglobin. So there's an ancestral hemoglobin, all right? For, and this is a fish, this is an amphibian, bird, and mammals. So there's an ancestral hemoglobin that is common to all of these vertebrates, you see? Because of that homology. And that's the kind of uh, uh, comparative homology that is done at the molecular level. It can be done on the proteins, but it can also be done on the genes themselves. And here is the famous Hox gene. The Hox gene is the homeotic box. And the homeotic box is basically the center. Homeotic box is like the trunk of the body, all right, for um, animals. And it's the one that carries the basic layout, the basic body plan, if you will where the head is gonna be, where the trunk is gonna be, where the abdomen, if there's an abdomen or the appendages and so forth, that's the homeotic box. It's what establishes the basic lineup, the basic anatomy of uh, animals. The percentage homology in the Hox genes, the, the ones that form the homeotic box is tremendous, it's incredible. Look at this. For example, here's a roundworm, which typically they're parasites. All right, look at the percentage homology with a beetle, all right? And the percentage homology with a nautilus, which is a mollusk, marine, mm -hmm. and a starfish. And this is a lancelet, this lancelet, this is a chordate, this is a primitive chordate mm -hmm. that, uh, that is uh, essentially a precursor to a fish. So, Look at the percentage homology, all these different groups that are so distant from each other uh, at the level of the classification, right, of species. Then we get into vertebrates. Look at the percentage homology with amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals of the homeobox because uh, these Hox genes are conserved. It's called conserved. In other words, they're ancient and they keep their same basic structure, the same basic DNA sequence, because they're determining the basic body plan of all of these animals. Again, uh, longitudinally from head to tail, if you will, that the head actually develops at the head end and not at the tail end and vice versa, okay? So it's considered all of these came from a common ancestor that had a bilateral distribution a longitudinal lengthwise bilateral uh, body plan and that's where it come from okay uh, okay the homology is very different for example when you compare it to a jellyfish which doesn't have bilateral symmetry has radial symmetry mm -hmm. and so the bilateral body plan was established early on only for bilateralia for animals that have a lengthy body plan where you can distinguish a head from a tail. Whereas radiates, uh, animals that develop in a radial symmetry, symmetry 
have a very different Hox genes uh, homeobox uh, sequence. So uh, these also, but they have some small homology like the brown and the blue region. So it is conceivable that there was a common ancestor between the bilaterals and the radials back further back into common ancestry to an original sequence, original single sequence. And this also uh, illustrates how uh, the possibility of genes and how our genomes became expanded and to the point that we have 3 billion base pairs in our genes, right, today. Uh, it's thought that one common characteristic was a duplication of genes. So here's an ancestral Hox gene sequence that duplicated and they became two Hox genes. And therefore, this is the beginning of segmentation, of body segmentation, which we see there's a lot of segmentation that we see in insects, for example, the abdomen is segmented and even the thorax and the head are also segments. And in some animals, the segmentation is more obvious than another. For example, the tapeworm is totally segmented into pieces and so forth. We also have certain level of segmentation. For example, we have representation of ribs and there's a certain sequence between the small intestine, the large intestine, there's some level of segmentation. The chambers of the heart can also be seen as, as segmented and so forth. So this could be possibly repetition of genes. And then once you have duplicates of those genes in a sequence, each gene may have some spontaneous mutations and begin to diversify, begin to become more different, slightly different in function, in other words, coding for proteins that are slightly different than its original, um, the original that it came from. So when you get duplicates or copies over a long period of time with <clears throat> spontaneous mutations mostly, <clears throat> begin to diversify, <clears throat> excuse me, into different segments of the body, coding for eventually a head as opposed to a trunk as opposed to an abdomen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, along with this, of course, the, the underlying premise and fact today, because it's been proven abundantly, is that DNA or its variant RNA is the universal molecule of inheritance. In other words, the DNA itself is reflecting a sequence. It's definitely linear in its information and the uh, <clears throat> The uh, bases, the base pairs are aligned sequentially, all right? They're not clustered in a spiral, in a, um, in a radial shape or pentagonal. No, it's sequential. It's like the letters on, on words on the book that are sequential one next to another. You don't have letters coming up from the top and the bottom of words and so forth. It's linear, all right? And it's very amenable for an orderly fashion of information. And of course, it stands to reason that when that information is deciphered, the product is also going to be a linear sequence, which is the polymers of the proteins, what, what makes up the, uh, the polypeptides. Mm -hmm. And then the proteins themselves conform into a three-dimensional shape, which allows them to have some kind of functionality according to the particular shape. Something similar to a key going into a lock has to be the proper shape for that lock, all right? But that's at the three-dimensional level of the protein itself. Underlying that uh, uh, third dimension, which is called the quaternary structure of the protein, is a sequence. At the very basic, it's a sequence of, of uh, amino acids that corresponds to a sequence of DNA, of uh, base pairs. So. We can do this kind of interesting and exciting thing, which other people consider boring, is to line up the genes and then look at percentage homology. For example, there are four here, there are four human Hox genes, Hox A, Hox B, C, and D. We line them up in their sequence and we see what percentage homology they have with the fly. This is the fruit fly Drosophila, right? Which is also used in the lab because they give us a generation very fast the next generation. And uh, <clears throat> we line up and we can see the percentage homology on the sequence. And it's illustrated even in color here. You see the homeobox determines the body pattern. 
the basic body plan, right? Corresponds along the spinal cord to the basic body plan of uh, the baby, uh, or this could be a fetus or an embryo, the head region, then where it belongs to the trunk and eventually down to the rump region to the posterior end of uh, the human in this case, all right? So you see the matchup in color of all the genes. And there's these, this region is known as highly conserved. It's conserved because it goes, imagine from the flight to us, how many species it needs to go through, all right? A fly is not even a vertebrate. It doesn't even have an internal skeleton, it has an external skeleton, it's an arthropod. It belongs to the insects. And yet look at the percentage homology that there is in the homeobox, in the Hox genes, because these genes are ancient and they're called highly conserved, meaning that they come from a common ancestor, most likely. But of course, like uh, Meyer points out, that the problem with common ancestry is that uh, it is, um, it is, they're extinct, right? By definition, ancestors are extinct. So we can infer evolution, but we can't actually observe it in the process because we would have to be living for millions of years, literally to, to be able to, to, to watch it occurring, all right? So we infer uh, the evolutionary process. This is down to the base level, to the nucleotides, uh, G, G, A, T, G, C, and I think it's yeah, you can see the sequence there, right? So this is down to the nucleotide level. This is what are called bases, the four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and, and adenine, uh, the four bases that make up the skeleton of the DNA sequence. And they're also known as nucleotides. And we look at percentage, GC percentage, all right? Or percentage GC content. And we can look at percentage homology between the bird, uh, lemur, which is a type of uh, monkey type, uh, chimp, human, dog, cat, cow, and pig. And you find the percentage homology here, uh, especially looking at GC uh, uh, sequences. Anyway, this also tells us, this allows, so when we do this kind of analysis at the level of nucleotide, right, the level nucleotide, and we line up the percentage homology, we will see that the one, the two that are closest, that have a highest percentage, they go next to each other, are gonna be the bird and the lemur, uh, sorry. Uh, for example, the chimp and the human here. Look at this sequence, it's almost identical. A, G, A, G, G, C, A, C, here is one off, G, C, all right. Uh, T, G, G, T, T, G, T, T, A, A, G is another off. Only two so far in the whole sequence. A, T, G, C, T, A, G, A. Here's another G, A, T, T, A, three. In this whole sequence between the human and the chimp, there are only three differences, all right? Then we look at, for example, what's the next one over? Lemur. When we look at the lemur, we're gonna find a few more. Here's a T already. Uh, here's a C and an A. All right, so here's another T. So there's gonna be more with the lemur. Let's say that there's six with the lemur. Then that creature is gonna be a little closer, uh, but further away from chimp and human. So we have to add one more node and so forth. So we can do nodes depending on the percentage of homology on the sequence. And we can go back and construct a cladogram, oops, sorry, on the relationship, right? And then we can say that the cow and the pig are closer to each other than the cow and the cat, for example, because to get to the, from the pig to the cow, I only have to go through one node. But to get from the pig to the cat, I have to go one, two, three nodes. All right, and so forth. And we can develop this uh, diagram, the clad cladogram pointing to the nearest common ancestor going back. And this could be done if you have a lot of time in your hands, you can do this with any sequence of genes in any part of the body. You can look at RBCs, you can look at any proteins of the body, all right? 
and do this kind of sequential thing, which has been done. In fact, they blast the whole genome, and that's where we end up with a 99% compatibility with the chimp, 98% compatibility with the gorilla, and 97% compatibility with the orangutan, <laughs> mm -hmm. which are the other uh, three primates. Okay, so this is basically stating graphically what I just uh, told you. Mm, the anthropoids, uh, Lagomorpha are the rabbits and the hares and rabbit-like uh, creatures, mm, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see the percentage homology shown here in different colors. Mm. Here, for example, between the bison and the dolphin. All right, cetaceans and ungulates. So these uh, regions that are conserved means that they go back in ancestry. Then we can measure something as a molecular clock. In other words, we can ask what makes a difference? What made this G become a T, all right? Or uh, do the flip? Well, those are mutations. Those are spontaneous mutations that can be measured also because the rate of mutation, the background mutation uh, is known. And um, an average uh, one mutation every 10,000 years. And so we can put a clock on it and we can measure the the more mutations have occurred, the further back the organism. So we can try to put a date on these nodes going back using what is known as the molecular clock. All right, the molecular clock. And so it tends to be fairly linear distribution that we can go from the rate of mutation into millions of years, okay? But Meyer also points out that be careful because the rate of mutation may also shift over uh, time. And so it's not that accurate, but it can give us an approximate uh, time range or at least which was earlier and which was later in the, in the evolutionary process. So we can build more sophisticated cladograms here going all the way from the primates to E. coli to bacteria on the evolutionary scale in millions of years, an average percentage in DNA or change in the DNA. For example, in the primates, 0.5% down here, whereas we, when we go closer to zero here, it has greater change of DNA, right? Down to 32% change uh, when we get to the level of E. coli, uh, which is estimated to have been uh, here, the scale is in 68 million years ago, the branching between bacteria and uh, archaea, uh, uh, between bacteria and uh, eukarya, right? So that's how when we put this together for all the different species and the groups that have been classified today, that's how we come up with this type of um, tree of life, okay, with the three big domains of the archaea and the bacteria and the eukarya, the ones that have true nucleus. But like I mentioned, we're sticking with a simpler uh, cladogram or classification, which is the classical five kingdom of the plants, animals, and fungi, which are mostly macroscopic. We can see with our eyes. Then the kingdom of the Moneras, monerans are bacteria and archaea. And then we have, which are unicellular, sometimes colonial. And then we have the proteus, which is really a grab bag for microorganisms that truly don't have any similarity between them other than they're microscopic and typically unicellular, All right? But it's just a, a practical, easy classification of uh, species. But it also points to the biodiversity that we have of, again, the 2 million species have been classified so far. Okay, so bottom line, from different angles, different studies, different sciences, all pointing to the possibility of the process of evolution. You see, in other words, this can be explained through what we're calling evolution, that one species may eventually, over a long period of time, and spontaneous mutations may eventually become another species. And that's what we call speciation. 
And the fact when we look at this in the big picture is what we find is actually a dynamic state where in the big picture of, of billions of years, species are constantly arising and becoming extinct, all right? And that's how we come up with those trees of life that show species uh, arising and disappearing. For example, with a horse, earlier I had one of those cladograms that is vertical. You see here, there's a common ancestor. Here are some branching. Some branches eventually end up in dead ends. Well, those are extinctions. So the branching sideways are extinctions, but then new branches come out and eventually they become extinct. All these little fingers become extinct at some point in the evolutionary scale of time. And only the uh, branches, the little branches that are at the surface of the tree of life for, for these uh, animals are the ones that are living today, all right? And what we call the Holocene or contemporary time. But back in the geologic times, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, many species became extinct. And those are the fossil records that we find in those different layers of uh, stratigraphy of, um, of the earth. Okay, thank you very much. You've been very patient. Review this and look at uh, uh, chapter two of Meyer. I don't think we'll have a problem in integrating chapter two of Meyer to this lecture because it's basically taken from there. Okay. And if you want to read ahead, let's start looking at chapter three that we'll look at for the origin of life coming up uh, next, uh, next lecture. I have a question. Yes. Um, there's like so much evidence of the theory of evolution. Then why has it been so like either created or uh, why is it like so? Yeah, so controversial, right? And antagonistic. It's a good question actually. And it gets into philosophy and theology and religion because sadly, uh, not only have religious people not have this kind of background, so the typical religious person doesn't have this background, especially in the hierarchy of the church, for example, you know, uh, <clears throat> you don't find too many bishops who are biologists or anything like that. Uh, but uh, not only that, on the religious side, so they're kind of skeptical, they don't really understand many times the science of it, but the converse is also true. In other words, today you find many scientists who are not necessarily religious people, don't even open the Bible, they think that it's a myth, they think it's just fairy tale, that it has no connection to reality. So there are misperceptions on both sides, okay? To the point that today, because the predominant um, paradigm for science today, being that when we talk about science, we mean empirical science, right? Things that can be measured. <laughs> Well, God is a hypothesis. How do you prove the existence of God and so forth? You can't measure it. So does he really exist and what does he do? Is he really just creating things like with a little lightning rod? So scientists are also skeptical of religion and theology and even philosophy, okay? And that's the challenge there that uh, these two camps don't necessarily wanna to talk to each other, but that's up until last century because in, in, in the 1900s already, there was an increasing dialogue between science and religion to the point that we have the emergence of fields, even bioethics has an ethical dimension, which could be uh, interpreted in a, in a religious or theological way. But it's true, it's, it's just two camps that haven't bothered to look at the evidence from the other side, okay? And, and perhaps if uh, sometimes this became a little more religious, they would be more open to the possibility of the compatibility between the creation story, the creation narrative, and the scientific evidence that they have in front of them. Also, it has not, it has not helped that um, for many years, centuries, uh, the Bible was interpreted to the story of creation was 6,000 years ago. That's what uh, Meyer mentions in that first chapter, a, a static earth of uh, recent creation, right, of recent origin. 6,000 years in geologic time is nothing. 6,000 yeah. years is the beginning of agriculture in, in Mesopotamia. <laughs> okay, we had walking humans already uh, galore. And so mm, yeah. it doesn't make sense to talk about 6,000 years, but that came from the biblical counting of genealogies 
going back to Adam and Eve, even in the narrative of the Gospel of Luke, and Matthew how they mentioned the, the, the ancestors of Jesus and the ancestors of Mary, okay? And when they count generations of about 20 years each, or maybe 100 years, like it says in the Bible, they come up with 6,000 years, all right? So it's just unfortunate that these two camps haven't been talking to each other too much until just until last century. But now there's much more dialogue going on. Okay, and this is part of it. <laughs> okay, folks, thanks again. I don't know, Jordan, Chris, you're okay? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I actually uh, had a question yeah. um, about the um, chapter two reading. Yes. Uh, would you be able to scan that copy and send it because I haven't received the book yet? Oh my goodness, haven't. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'll do that and send it over. <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh, this one, no, you didn't come for. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. No, he's talking about chapter, because for Chris, I mailed him a book and it's still not there. So then I bought another one, I put the same address there. So hopefully you'll get one or the other soon. Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I got it yet. So what I'm doing is I'm just scanning the chapter for now and emailing it to him. Okay. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Okay. I'm trying to program one Saturday to see. Well, let me let me finish the let me stop the recording so I can start. Uh, uh, <laughs> Professor, you said.